speaking from my end of the world. Good afternoon from your end of the world, Deb mm -hmm. Malkin. Did I say your, your name right, Malkin? Yes, Malkin. Yep. Mal Malkin. And um, my name's Dr. Tova Goldfine. I tend to forget to introduce myself. And then people are like, who is that woman speaking so much? <laughs> I'll be quiet in a minute, but I get excited. I'm excited every week for five years. I'm just excited to be here and blessed. This is TMS Roundtable Recovery, and I'm Doc Tova. And um, Deb has been on the show before with Rose, um, who's down from on the, the, the stairway to heaven with us all the time, my dear Rose. And I remember I couldn't come that day and Rose interviewed you. So I, I don't really know you, but uh, I am so excited um, to be in this Holy Studio with you. Like I said, there are a lot of people who know you and, and like are your fans. I could just tell as I was sharing that you were gonna be here. Um, whether it's the people from this particular site or that site or that Facebook page. Um, but you have made a beautiful name and a statement in this mind-body community, which we are a strong, um, a strong voice of a certain percentage of, of helping people to heal themselves. So I want to say a few things about you, Deb. Um, you're a certified life coach, body worker, hypnotist, which you're still studying, very interesting pain recovery coach, um, sharing what tips and all for rewiring persistent pain and emotional overwhelm. And I got this little bio from your, the Curiosity Cure, mm -hmm. Mind Body Wellness, which is your podcast. Yes. Which um, I posted a little bit and we could talk a little bit about. Um, I did not know specifically until I saw your bio that, um, let, me, let me just put, I wanna put up something about you right here. Okay. Um, Deb, that you also maybe were not, you were not in this field until you healed your own pain. Is that what was going on? And then one thing led to another. Mm -hmm. And um, so tell, let's talk, let's start with that knee pain or let's start with that anger or fear that was <laughs> driving you from age whatever to give you chronic knee pain. If you don't mind starting from so yeah. you don't mind, share with our listeners. Um, so I think, so my like, you know, knee pain to recovery story is is pretty similar to a lot of people's, right? It's like you go through the medical model and then you're noticing that things aren't feeling better. And then there's like something that you hear out in the world. So I was, um, at this time, I was 50. I was training to climb Kilimanjaro. And I, um, with a group of plus size women, which was very exciting, which I, I did. And, but I was having this recurring knee pain at the same time I was working as a massage therapist. And I was also training in restorative exercise. Um, and like, which is a very like biomechanical, um, alignment kind of work. And what I noticed was my pain was getting worse and worse and worse. The more that I was diving deep into this body-based practice that was all about having proper alignment and that if I had the right alignment, then my pain would go away and I would have better function. Um, the more I was doing that work, the more my pain increased. And I just was like, this is not supposed to be how it happens. And I started, you know, thinking, well, maybe it's my age and maybe it's my size. Um, and then a friend of mine had posted about her recovery story from migraines um, through the Curable app and just reading about that and that kind of like paradigm shift because that was my first introduction. Yeah. Wow. And I was like, what are you talking about that you can yeah. like take this? There's a mind body approach <laughs> to physical. What does my mind have to do with what it? Is this mind? I mean, and as a massage therapist, I started to really get this sense that like people would come in with their complaints and they would tell me what hurts. And if I only focused my massage work on what hurts, they would leave feeling worse. Wow. And that if I was focusing my, rec my massage practice on like their whole being, 
and how they want it. Like I finally started adapting my language to be from like what hurts to how would you like to feel at the end of our time together? So like if there is a word or a phrase that describes that feeling and then I could attend to what was hurting, but also really leave them hopefully with that sense of how they wanted to feel. And then people felt better, their pain started recovering. And so I started to take like that understanding. And I was like, how can I apply this to myself? Because like, I'm not going to get younger and, you know, I'm not going to like lose weight maybe ever or tomorrow. And I was like doing a lot of hiking. So I had a lot of like, you know, physical capacity. Um, and once I realized that it was about fear and like the, these kind of embedded beliefs about the body and that then I was able to like shift my perspective. And so one, I just noticed that I was very, very high stakes, both in my training, my biomechanics training of like having the right alignment, like having to do it perfectly. And of course my body looked different than most of the other people in my training. So I'm oftentimes like, especially in a lot of mobility, like movement based practices, I'm often the largest person there. So I'm always having to adapt these practices to myself, but like I have a strong drive to want to do it right. And if I do it right, then it means like I'm a good student. And so there's a lot of those like TMS personality types showing up in there. And so once I was able to see like that is driving this sense of fear and this sense of alienation within my own body, which I think is really supported in like diet culture. Mm -hmm. So this sense of like, of course your body doesn't work. Of course you're in pain because of your size. Um, so once I was able to kind of like touch into that perfectionism and touch into that um like noticing that all the practices that i were doing were about like controlling my body rather than being with it mm -hmm. um i was able to just take myself for a walk one day um in between clients and i took myself for what i call like my recovery walk wow so i was having pretty intense pain and i just took myself for this slow and gentle walk and i started to just talk to my me wow Jeez. and i was like hey me <laughs> i love you and i want you to feel safe and my knee is like i do not feel safe with you because <laughs> all you're doing is telling me what i'm doing wrong wow. like all you're doing is trying to control this like you know this knee pit alignment and like my rotation mm -hmm. of my femur mm -hmm. and it was all very like strict mm -hmm. trolling and i was like okay i hear you and you know i think before this i hadn't really ever talked to my body and listened i was usually like pointing my finger and yeah. trying to tell it to do well, things. i want to I interrupt and say like it's it's so um inspiring because you accept yourself this is who i am I'm not the typical, I'm lovable, I'm, you know, um, proud of myself. Yeah. I'm going to do what I want to do. I'm going to go a little bit out of my comfort zone and be really comfortable with it. I'm really comfortable. But there was a part of you that was not an authentic. Sure. You were being authentic and like, hey, I'm authentic. And this other part was the judgment, the critical, the noticing that. And that's a relationship that was almost like there was a conflict from the authenticity the authentic mm -hmm. part of you right wanting to really be naked with yourself with your clothes on and really be honest and that's mm -hmm. an interesting physio psychological thing reflecting yeah. in your knee which is about moving forward yeah fascinating but i also need to name that like my teacher who's like a very beloved very followed teacher of this work you know, didn't single me out, but this was the approach to getting out of pain. Wow. And this approach, which is about controlling and fixing and, and having like there, we, we never talked about the nervous system. We never talked about safety. So there are practices out in the world that when you sign up and you train and you like want to get a certification and you want to help other people and 
So like that helper part of me is like, this is what's going to help me and other people feel less pain. That came from, you know, uh, I didn't make that up, right? <laughs> like it came from the the information that I got from this very well-respected um, teacher. Ooh. And what I realized was for me, there was this whole underground piece that was missing, which was that sense of safety and that sense of self-connection versus self-alienation. Wow. And so once I realized that, then I actually could see that experience like in so many places, like I could see it in my gym class when I was growing up, like the lack of like, you know, everybody like it, having joyful movement, right? Like, no, we had the presidential fitness test and you had to like compete against each other and there was a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And some people's bodies are good and some people's bodies are bad. So I was really able to like, wow, like blow open this thing. And, and I had a, to grieve that like this practice, this like movement practice wasn't going to be no. the right answer. You know, I had spent money on it. I spent time. Yeah, the problem was not physical. It was not a physical knee problem. It was not a physical knee problem. So, and I proved that to myself because at the end of that kind of like recovery walk, recovery walk or peace walk or whatever it was, like I had this conversation and I promised my knee that it would do better. <laughs> I was like, I love you. And I promise I'm going to like, not keep treating you this way. And so I was like, you know, let's, let's enjoy this walk. Let's go like, instead of focusing on like, are my, is my femur rotated the right way? And are my feet aligned? Let's like, notice the pretty flowers around, like, let's just notice how the breeze feels um on your skin like let's just enjoy this walk and so and i did and then i went back to work and i noticed throughout the day that i was constantly having to bring my attention back from checking my alignment i had like inadvertently trained myself to be so self like self-critical like self-assessing mm -hmm. you know which has this my intention wasn't to be critical but I was always observing myself and kind of comparing myself to how I was told I was supposed to be and what wow. the right way to be was. And of course, I was never the right way. And so I was always like doing this internal scan all day long throughout the day, which I thought was the right thing to do. Because of course, in my bodywork practice, I'm being really physical and I'm helping people. But there was like a part of my brain that was always like, judging and checking internally like what i was doing and if it was right and so i had to bring that part back to me and just be like that's not what we're doing now and just right. i would like sink back in to the right. present moment to the connection with my client and i would just think well i'm here to create a sense of safety for them on the table and i'm going to do the same thing for me wow. in my day in my body in this moment and by the end of the day I had like 85% less pain. Whoa. I woke That's up the beautiful. next day. I had like 95, 98% less pain. And I was just like, I don't know what that is, but that it feels like a miracle. <coughs> I My pain had only been getting worse and worse and worse. That's not how it's supposed to go. You're not just supposed to like change your thoughts and your feelings and then have your pain uh, go away the next day, even though you're, you're one day older <laughs> and I didn't, you know, my body size was exactly the same. No. As and Gordon, like Gordon says, and you know, cause you study with um, these guys, I mean, it's counterintuitive. This is counterintuitive pain. Mm -hmm. This is not physical pain. This is neuroplastic pain. And so that's where you're going to see. And I'm sure you realize after you study that that was that your lizard brain Mm -hmm. protecting you and we tr thank you lizard brain for protecting me i'm so happy you're there but let me just tell you when i need you and yeah. i'll and i'll hear you and yeah. i'll say hey let's go have coffee together lizard brain because you're there and that's what your job is but i'm not here to get rid of you i'm here to you know to 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 integrate with you and live a life with you lizard brain totally and i think for me what was really powerful was like 
getting to see like all of the subconscious messages that we absorb about our bodies and about and just like realizing that it was my job to create a lot of like safe landing places for yeah. me within my body within mm -hmm. my today body and just then just yeah. know what i know about physiology to help keep me moving mm -hmm. and feeling good and having like feeling connected in a way that feels really mm -hmm. loving that feels really powerful yeah. um and so yeah it's been an amazing journey but that moment was um was like the turning point right so i jumped right into being you know using the curable app and then i studied with dr schubiner and charlie merrill because i thought i was going to integrate this work into my massage practice but then during COVID, i ended up um having to be in florida with my father and so my massage practice went away and so then i just was like okay i figured i was gonna do this work as a coach and see if that would work because i didn't have this hands-on practice anymore but i had the experience of being a massage therapist for 10 years right right, so. right. no it was amazing and, and tell us the next step so you understood your body was protecting you and how to bring safety. And then you spent, you're spending the rest of your life doing that because it, yeah. it's, it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And then you began to study. Uh, I've never studied with Charles Merrill, but, I, but he's, mm -hmm. he seems um, fascinating and, and Trubiner. And then I know you had interviewed Yoni Asher. So I saw the yeah. connection between you and the PRT, the pain processing therapy. And I was very excited mm -hmm. um, because that's exactly what you just described without you even knowing it. Yeah. Your, your brain perceiving a fire coming perceiving and mm -hmm. protecting you right. um you know in every way and you did everything possible physically and then you you really sounds like you had a little bit of a smoother landing than some of the people you maybe um well, I, to. I had um a really good foundation mm -hmm. so i had many years of being a body worker I also had many years of like being kind of a rebellious body positive, you know, fat activist. <laughs> I had a lot of um, like non-conforming uh, personality in me. And so I think once I was able to bring that kind of like body-based knowledge, like I started doing massage therapy in my forties. So I went, I could tell and I could see, like I went from, you know, doing two massages a day was really tiring. And then I could do like six massages a day. So I really noticed like, oh, the body builds capacity. You know, we have the said principle, like, so our body adapts to what we do. Beautiful. So there's, I was just able to, I have a very, like, I have a very, you know, kind of ability to see through a lot of um, mess, like negative messaging about people's bodies. Um, and really able to reorient myself back into what feels true for me. But then adding the mind body lens, which is to understand that the nervous system, you know, presses the gas or the brakes, like it can give us any, you know, symptom, it can give us any experience. And so a lot of times when we really resource that sense of safety in our bodies, then that muscle tension, you know, fades and that, you know, it's almost like you take the emergency brake off and then the car can go, right? Yeah. If you have that break on, like nothing's happening. Right, right. No, I mean, it's really interesting. And so I think that experience in itself has mm -hmm. taught you adversity. Yeah. And, you know, Doc Hanscom and I talk a lot about the ego and how the ego, uh, you know, it, it, it can hurt us, you know, and not to talk about Freud, but the ego has a purpose and it's sort of, it's this creation, it's in the, mental creation hi scotty. hi scotty he's one of your fans and, um, and, and the ego and the ego can also help us it can help us in many ways if we use it in a balanced way but it can hurt many people with tms and mm -hmm. body mind pain because how many people like heal from a, a Sarno story and then they get the pain again. They can't even believe they got the pain again. Like I can't even imagine why I'm not healing again. And there's the ego. Yeah. How could I not? I'm doing everything. How could I not? And this is a big doing thing. Everything right. That's like always the yeah. thing that I hear and I have so much compassion. Yeah. I've had that too. And it's just like, 
yeah, our body needs things from us, our body and our mind and our nervous system. Like we're, you know, until we're not alive anymore, like we always need to attend to the self. And, you know, I find these mind body practices work uh, on everything. Like it's changed my orientation to being alive, um, which I am so, so grateful for. Yeah. I mean, you know, from my studies, and the people I've met, you know, this big, this big heart doctor, this big heart surgeon here in Israel, he's now not doing heart surgery anymore. He's very involved in helping people with cancer. Mm -hmm. It's like, Tova, cancer is a cry of the soul. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds a little bit, you know, woo woo, but the, the body is made to heal. And when it's attacking itself, there's Mm -hmm. an attack and there's you there's, you know, there's your unconscious mind and your conscious mind and your body's attacking itself and you've got autoimmune disease and cancer, God forbid, and all these different things, let alone chronic pain. It's really, you are the placebo. You are the place where the healing will come and the body knows the solution before the problem. You have been whole, you have been well, and you can get there. And so it is a relationship with you and the ego needs to have a place yeah. <laughs> and with humility and, and love and compassion. And, mm-hmm. you know, I'm, I'm into the Joe Dispenza work and he was saying something in this meditation about gratitude. Like, mm-hmm. it's just this medical, like you're like, in, you're like injecting like medicine when you're just grateful. Like it's just changing mm-hmm. all the chemical neurons by just being grateful. I'm like, Dispenza saying that, like, this is like, sort of woo woo, but this is the science and they're studying when somebody's grateful or journaling what's happening with your neurons firing and wiring. Sure. I mean, like there's, there's always so, I find science very fascinating. And at some point it's like, you know, there's this, uh, this kind of leap of trust that I ask people to take. And for me, it's never about reaching some kind of like, perfect end that that what you're saying like it is this relationship it is the relationship you are going to be in for the rest of your life and um so really being able to create this sense of um like hope but the the internal ability to attend and be with and love and accept oneself and especially when you have to wade through so many messages from the world that like your body is failing and your body is wrong or the only way to get better is to go through this medical model and all they really have to offer are surgeries and medications and injections they do that well and they do that well they do do that well and sometimes those things are absolutely um Necessary. necessary and also um there's this sense there's just so many, many messages that we receive that like, um, that are not supportive of that sense of wholeness, that they're more kind of supported. They're more like these um, ideals that are, if you're not, if you don't fit this ideal, then you're almost not entitled to wellness or health. Right. And so I think it, like talking about that ego or that sense of self, like it, people do not feel that connection to health and healing and wellness because they don't meet this, you know, kind of like thin ideal um, of what health is, yeah. that what we're sold that health yeah. is. And I think that it's really important to take back um, even just the idea of health and well being. Um, and, and make it personal and meaningful so that people can start to develop and have that inner conversation within themselves and not be comparing themselves all the time. And then, and then have these tools to start getting curious, to start investigating like, okay, when I wake up in the morning and I'm feeling kind of, you know, feeling uh, a little creaky or a little, you know, um, I don't know. I wake up with a little headache. Like, what am I saying to myself about what my day is, what my body is, what's possible for me? Yeah. 
Yeah. No, very good point. A very good point. So, Kim, I'm happy to see you, Kim. Kim's uh, pretty certain she's living in Britain. She comes to visit the show. May, can you see the question over there? Yeah, um, I do. Hi, Kim. Mm -hmm. I'm so sorry about your loss. That is really hard when we lose people. I wow. think sometimes the for me, what helps is just to really deeply acknowledge that today is really hard. One of the things that I help my clients with is a sense of chronicity that like our subconscious mind doesn't really know time. So sometimes when we're having an experience, a flare, a hard emotional experience, like there's a part of our brain that thinks it's gonna be this way forever. So I always just recommend that we hold our own hand, that we think like, this is my today body, right. this is my today emotion. Right. And to tomorrow will be itself. And, you know, and then there's the invitation, which is what is the invitation? Like, how can you attend to yourself and your heart mm -hmm. and your body mm -hmm. when you have this, had mm -hmm. this experience that you've lost a good friend? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, and then I don't know, you know, I always recommend like people doing somatic tracking, like whatever of the mm -hmm. tools that people know to do that kind of loving attention into mm -hmm. themselves. So some people, you know, practice journal speak and so they'll journal out the feelings mm -hmm. and then end with a self yeah. Um, yeah. meditation. But there's so mm -hmm. many different ways to yeah take care of ourselves but mm -hmm. also like some days we struggle and struggling is just an incredibly human experience yeah. i mean kim you know maybe there's a dance that's happening like your own mortality is in front of you and you saw it with a good friend and so there's enormous sadness and so you know what if this neck pain was expressing your sadness now if you could express it through somatic tracking or journaling, maybe the pain wouldn't have to be there. Maybe yeah. you could be with the feeling and um, also know that your body's protecting you because it's sensing a threat and the threat is you're sad and feeling very lost, a big yeah. loss. And maybe you're seeing, you know, dealing with your immortality. So your neck is protecting you because it's, you're giving it the message that there's a threat. Now it's a perceived threat, it's not real. Mm -hmm. friend has gone and there's a threat to your emotions but it's not you're okay you're safe yeah. or maybe that you're not safe like there's we shouldn't fight reality maybe you don't feel safe yeah you know i happen to be living in in a country where there's war and i don't feel safe in a way but i'm not in pain because i'm with my fears i'm with my sadness i'm with my broken heart i'm with my trust for the country I'm with my trust for god so I don't have physical pain, but there's a heaviness, there's a sadness, there's a, and I journal about it and I, I pray a lot more to the divine and to God. And I feel like that's getting me through because there's a threat to me, but nothing directly. And yet we're taught that if we're threatened, even we don't have to be in pain. We could be, I'm fucking scared. Yeah. I'm full of fear. Like, like, so maybe for you to be honest with yourself and authentic and be like, I am fucking sad. Man, my friend just died. I'm really sad. You know, and maybe you cried and that's the neck pain of like tension release. So yeah, you have, I know you have our hearts right here, here, Kim. And thank you for sharing that. And you know what? You're resilient. I know you, you will pass this. Thank you for sharing and talk about it with people. But more important is like, what's what what's the conversation with yourself? Sometimes we don't really want to have that conversation with ourselves. And Scotty is a, um, a really lovely mind body coach. I'll have to have you on my show, Scotty. I don't take it personal. I just <laughs> I get spaced out. But Scotty's in Canada, and you're always you're always talking with your friend. What's her name? She's amazing. Mimi. Talking great. with. Um, the woman who healed fibromyalgia, I'm blanking on her name right now. Uh, Jeannie Colwyn. Yeah, yeah, so you're doing some great work with Jeannie. 
and you're talking about wholeness integrates our higher self spirituality as well as our physical body mental yeah beautiful yeah. um scott scotty's wonderful you gorgeous soul you um mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway um yeah can i share something about um, please, that please. i like I, I talk to people about, you know, we get all kinds of messaging, like when we're young about like crying or not crying. And, you know, so we have a sense of like, you know, how much we, how many feelings we're allowed to have. And one of the things that I just read was that um, when we are sad, like when we're crying emotional tears, they have more protein in it and they roll down your face in a different way, like more slowly which is meant to be like a cue to other people to connect with you wow. versus like if you're chopping onions, like the chopping onions tears are different and they're not a cue. They're not a social cue. And so I just think wow. like even our tears are there to help us, you know, we certainly, it helps us process mm -hmm. stress yeah. um, and, and a lot of times it's like, we're trying to put the stopper on the, yeah tears because we're afraid if i start crying i won't stop yeah, yeah. You will yeah you will. because yeah. all emotions are temporary and yeah. so what i love about that is always resourcing um the wisdom of the body this like amazing miracle that you know like our body heals all the time like if we yeah. get a cut a paper cut we don't have to think to heal our paper cut it heals like our job is mostly just to get out of the way, like make the right environment and then let the body do what it knows how to do. I love it. Yeah. So um, I do want to talk about, um, yeah. I do want to talk about this, your, the curiosity, sure. cure, your yeah. mind, body, pick, and I love the word curiosity. And it was Rose that taught me and I'm, I catch myself all the time because sometimes some things I'm a quick learner, some things I'm a slow learner, but I catch myself saying, you know, well, why do you think that's happening? Or what do you, why do you, and I'm like, are you curious? And that was Rose. Are you curious? And it's such a nicer way to be with yourself and talk to yourself. It's a, it's a, it's a language of, hi, what's going on? It's like this, it's 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 the PRT training and the somatic training of, hey, everything's going to be okay. And we don't always have that ability to talk mm -hmm. with ourselves. We kind of talk at ourselves. Mm -hmm. So the curiosity cure, I love it. It's magnificent. And it's such a beautiful take-home tool to the listeners yeah. to please stay curious mm -hmm. um, about your symptoms. Yeah. Please stay curious about yourself please be patient with that curiosity and to, mm -hmm. to do not point the finger. I mean, there are people who pointed fingers at us and, you know, mm -hmm. we, we get to, you know, forgive them and not, and not take on their, 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 their shit. Right. They did it because they were telling us what to do because that's what they're, that's how they, they, that's how they loved us. Sure. But, but to be curious, Kim, yeah. is this, talk about that. Talk about why that word. How you, you named your podcast yeah. that. Um, I think when I, you know, been studying a lot of different things, right? So studied PRT and studied mind body work with Dr. Schubiner and uh, even doing work as a life coach and then studying hypnosis, like all of the through lines are about the ways that we attend to what we're experiencing differently than our first response. And that really does require curiosity. So, right, which is the rather than I know the I know what's happening or like if you wake up one morning and you have neck pain, you're like, why? How did I sleep wrong? Right. right. Like, oh, I this again. Going into the physical, like I must have done something. And then mm -hmm. when you think I must have done something, then you just naturally go down that that road of trying to figure out what you did so you could not do it and then you won't have that pain again. But what we now know about pain is that it's a complex bio, you know, psychosocial experience. And a lot of it is based on meaning, right? That it is this part of our protection system. So if we, instead of assuming, just getting curious and be like, what is it that I feel like I need protection 
from right now? What is it? What is ringing this alarm bell? Is it something emotional? Am I having a fear? Is it, um, you know, I don't know, just right. Like, I don't know. It's right. a wide open right. frame. Is, I don't know. Has, is, is I don't know. Okay. With you. Is, is it okay that you don't know? Cause yeah. that's also a sense of calm. Mm -hmm. I don't know is an answer. I don't know is a great answer, but people hate not knowing, right? Like the brain is like the last thing, like we will construct meaning that is so convoluted. And, you know, and a lot of the medical practices back us up. They're like, you know, somebody has like a disc herniation 12 years ago and they're like, well, my disc herniation from like way back when, that's why my back hurts. And I'm like, it doesn't, the body doesn't actually work that way. But, Even from one year ago, six yeah. months after six months, it's, you know, so we exactly. know that. Really and feel. so we have to really understand that we construct meaning. We construct and our perceptions of reality based on the meanings that we create. So when wow. we can blow up, like step out of, I know that this is this X equals X plus Y equals Z. Wow. Then we're able to step into this, into curiosity in a way that feels safe and obviously the through line of all mind body work is resourcing a sense of safety wow I love whether it's with your inner child whether it's with your actual physical body right now um or a, it's usually a mix of both right I love, it. I love it i love i love we really have a good hold on this work and so i'd love to shift mm -hmm. to the hip no hypnotist in you because yeah. I, I believe you, we could disagree because we're allowed to disagree and not have a war. Sure. <laughs> I think women could run this world and we wouldn't have wars, but it's the way it is now. So I'm told that behavior processing therapy is a type of hypnotherapy. And so is the somatic tracking. It's us. So I would love to talk about that because for some people that I've even worked with, I couldn't help with all my skills. Right. Hypnotherapy work because for them it was doing something that I'm not trained in, but I was yeah. fascinated and I'm fascinated to talk to you about that. I, you know, I mean, I think like so many people who do this work, I could talk about this stuff for literally forever. So um, I actually studied PRT and mind body work before I became a hypnotist. And what I noticed was the, the tone of Dr. Schubiner's voice and the repetition of the embedded, you know, suggestions of Alan Gordon. If you listen to his book, you start to really see that there is this hypnotic through line that's being delivered. So that there's like a message that's being delivered to the conscious mind. And then also this kind of the quality of the message being delivered to the subconscious self. And I was like, well, that sounds like hypnosis. <laughs> so maybe I will also go study that because I, you know, love, uh -huh. I'm a lifelong learner and I just love yeah. to learn things. And for me, what hypnosis really brought was what I missed from doing massage therapy, which I can't do anymore, or I'm choosing not to do it because I live in a different state mm -hmm. and all the states have different rules and whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, the universe was said that part is done. It's enough, must be. That's done, it's over. Um, is this, this um, like sense of relaxation that I don't always find in my PRT work, that I didn't always find in my mind body coaching, because we were very like up tempo talking about, talking about pain. You know, we would kind of try to slip into the experience in the prt work in the somatic tracking but it there is a almost more of a buy-in and i can be much more creative and weird in my hypnosis work because we're working a lot of times with metaphor so we're not actually talking about maybe that specific body part but we are talking about fear we're talking about sensation and it's like a different way of relating to what's happening in the body and so for me, it just opened up my ability to help people activate change. Wow. Much more wow. broadly. And it really suited me. Right. That's the thing. Like I'm not a therapist. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, so I wanted to also kind of make sure that I was in my own lane, that I wasn't kind of going down and like inadvertently doing therapy mm-hmm. when I was doing PRT work. So it really mm-hmm. helps it just mm-hmm. has given me a, like a mm-hmm. broad sense of tools and a broad understanding of um, neuroplasticity and how mm-hmm. to you know, rewire the brain to new experiences. So, so how can, without, you know, somebody having a lot of experience with new therapy, mm-hmm. what would be a take home tool? I like to call it that could help someone Mm-hmm. We'll say, well, we want it. We want you to bring calm and safety to your mm-hmm. brain. We want you to live yeah. in your parasympathetic nervous system more. We want you to tap into your vagus nerve and do some vagal t- toning. And we want you mm-hmm. to, you know, live and rest and digest. Right. So, would the hypnosis be more of a way somebody could could travel there quicker if they're no, they're aware that they're in a state of fight and flight? Yeah, I think the hypnosis allows people to, one, you're kind of bypassing the story sometimes. Mm. So you're able to attend to your nervous system. So one of the practices I like to use, and so I'll just share this, maybe it'll be helpful, is um, like thinking of a fabric that you really love. So maybe it's something that's super soft or just a kind of fabric, whatever it is that you absolutely love and a color that makes you feel the way you want to feel. And then imagining wrapping whatever body part in that color. And each time you wrap that fabric around, that color is sinking in, that feeling is sinking in. And just, it gives your brain something to attend to that allows, because when you're imagining that experience happening, your breath naturally slows you're wrapping it, you know, you give people suggestions to wrap it slowly. So then they're imagining wrapping it slowly. And when you ask somebody to do something slowly, you know, if they were like this, they come down, right? And so it's, and then what we notice is it starts to feel different. And then when things feel different, there's also a sense of relaxation, Mm -hmm. right? And then people can, Right. So it's not about the sense of tightly controlling our actions and activities and pain behaviors. Um, And it's even just noticing that you're shifting your state just very naturally by having the using this sense of imagination. Wow. Right. And so it's it's a lot less stressful than trying. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes when we're like, well, you know, you have to do these practices to get yourself into this state, that can be a really strong demand. And it also can help people feel kind of more distress that they are, you know, if you're noticing your fight or flight, uh, people tend to want to get into the story or they think that it can't be resolved because the issue that's causing them this sense of fight or flight hasn't mm-hmm. been resolved. But we also know that like mm-hmm. we can shift our state and our body through our physiology, through, through our imagination mm-hmm. at any point. And that when then we're more resourced. And one of the things we do in hypnosis is also build people's resources and help wire that in. So mm-hmm. in the mm-hmm. conver- hypnotic conversation mm-hmm. that will come up. Well, would this be a, a sign of hypnosis? Because I, I talk a lot about Dispenza's story where he, you know, he was in a bike accident and broke six bones and they wanted to operate and said, you'll be in a wheelchair, but at least let's do the surgery. And he decided he was going to do enormous kind of meditation and change his mm-hmm. neurology. And yeah, and he would. So would this be a hypnotic uh process because he would visualize himself walking yeah he would visualize himself feeling better and if yeah. he saw himself in a wheelchair he was he'd be, i'm not ready yet because i see myself in a wheelchair mm-hmm. so could part of it be visualizing yourself going for the walk absolutely visualize yourself this is also you know this might be more real well let me just I, i'll suggest this visualization mm-hmm. and trying to and I don't know if that, if you, 
maybe it's not hypnosis. Maybe it's really just visualization. And I'm well, just I, I think there's a lot of gray areas, right? So I think mental rehearsal mental and rehearsal. visualization is a, rehearsal, yeah. Yeah, is a hypnotic technique. I, what I, um, in hypnosis, you can move beyond reality in a way that can be really cool. So you can imagine, or you can also talk about revivifying old experiences. So like, remember having walked someplace, the, so someplace really beautiful that gives you the feeling that you want to be feeling and just remember that now. Right. Right. So that we're not visualizing particularly what's happening tomorrow, but we're visualizing now an experience that has happened, but placing it in this now or place it in, in the future, yeah. right? Because the mm -hmm. subconscious doesn't really have a sense of time yeah, in that way, right? So we're do still doing the mental rehearsal, but some people it's hard to imagine something that they can't yet believe is gonna be right. able to happen. Good point. And so, but it's a lot easier to remember something that you had and, you know, and maybe there's some grief that needs processing, but yeah. um, so I like that hypnosis blows out like the strict adherence to reality. Like you can imagine walking on the moon and that would be a perfectly suitable <laughs> visualization, except in, you know, if you were like, just, if you weren't using hypnosis, you might be like, why are they visualizing walking on the moon? They're never going to walk on the moon. That's yeah. really weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, there's a lot of freedom and creativity and imagination. And I think that brings delight. And as we know in PRT, like positive affect induction, right? Which just yeah. means how people feel good. Yeah. I love that there's like these fancy science words, but they're yeah. like, like, have good feelings. Yeah. There's so or, many different ways to access them. Right. And I think um, that kind of creative force is really powerful and helping people expand beyond what they believe is true and possible because sometimes we get so linear and so fixed and so like it has to be this way otherwise it won't work so i think that's kind of what i love about hypnosis because i find um, yes, I get like really excited and no, I love hearing about it. About it. my personality to have a place where it's like safely rooted yeah. and that we can, I can play yeah. with uh, my clients. Well, I, I think when somebody's <clears throat> in a lot, a lot of pain, maybe that's when I think about these <clears throat> certain people who don't fit you know, the mold, and surely you didn't either in many ways, and none of the people that healed have a mold, but there are people who are in just so much pain that it's a constant state of fight or flight. Yeah. It's hard for them to believe. And so um, <clears throat> sometimes I think hypnotherapy for them because there has to be some way they have to change their relationship with this pain. Mm -hmm. It has to be through their story, through their thought, through their language. and. Right. Well, in, in that regard, when people are in that high level of pain and that high level of, of fight or flight, there are techniques that help people like, um, I've seen techniques where like, you know, you're kind of separating your head from your body and that your head is going to someplace or your body part that hurts, like goes someplace happy and safe. Um, that there's a certain kind of type of like analgesia that you can help people create in their body. So some of it is like, uh, the hypnotic phenomenon is so unlike what they're experiencing day to day that all of a sudden the belief that things can be different yeah. is like unavoidable because already things are different. Yeah. And, weird. and yeah. so, and with some clients, like just that ability to find like a happy, safe refuge, just to go visit multiple times throughout the day where your body, you know, like you either don't feel anything or your body feels safe. Yeah. That just, that practice alone is powerful because how else, you know, their current reality says that's not possible. Yeah. Yeah. So that's so, that's so the quantum, it's very much the quantum. Yeah. I have a hard time with the quantum. Anyway, that's just a word. No, I know it's a word. It's like, I think it's like, you know, it's one of those words that like, 
people get excited about it and I'm like, but what does it mean? I used to, I used to throw the book away. Like I remember 20 years ago when I picked it up with uh, Deepak Chopra, I was like, yeah. this is crazy. Mm-hmm. And I threw it away and here I am like, I can't get it, it. it, but it's, 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 it can be called anything. Yeah. I mean, people <laughs> threw Dr. Sarno's book away. Right. Completely. But and here's the thing. I, I think often about the people that walk on coals, the people that are living, you know, with enormous pain and can rise above it. You know, like I promote mm-hmm. this movie called Facing Fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's 25 different authorities between Bruce Lipton and Joe and um, mm-hmm. a bunch of other great healers yeah. who come and speak. And some of them had, were in enormous fatal accidents where they were like bleeding out. Mm-hmm. And they went into a different story. Yeah. They didn't think that they could live and they had an opportunity to take a different story and live because mm-hmm. they were facing fear and they had a choice. And I think that's extreme, but this is what is possible with the human body and the human right. mind. Absolutely. But, you know, starting small and not having to be extraordinary uh, can be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Right. Like, I think there is a lot of pressure to think like, oh, I have to become Joe Dispenza to have that experience. Yeah. And, you know, right. I mean, that's how some people subconscious hears that. And I what I always love is is to really show people that change is possible. And all all humans, because our our bodies and our minds are more alike each other than than not, even though everybody's individual uh-huh. story is different. You know, our bodies and our brains are essentially the same. Yeah. 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 And and the brain is a piece of flesh that we program. Yeah. You know, and it gets programmed from birth, maybe before birth, but then we can affect that programming. And that's what we yeah. you know, we're to talk about. Oh, no. That you can, you can, you can, and to never give up and never give up. And yeah. I mean, I'm I'm checking out these people who are on Facebook a lot, maybe more than you. Mm-hmm. And there are so many people suffering yeah. and struggling. And I say it every broadcast. I mean, mm-hmm. look, the Buddha says struggling and suffering is a choice. That's a hard liner. What I'm a bit of a tough love, I'm a bit of like yeah. sometimes coming out of your comfort zone. You just got to push. You got to jump in. Yeah. And yet uh, suffering is an emotional reaction. It's not the physical thing. <laughs> it's yeah. our relationship with our pain. Mm-hmm. And um, I think the enormous compassion that even I've learned in this work, yeah, have, you know, even more compassion. But sometimes we need to, like, Tribuner would be like this woman who would talk to her brain, say, okay, brain, mm-hmm. come on. Or how about the people I've interviewed, ankylosing spondylitis and MS, yeah. They were like, okay, like pr- 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 uh, provocative testing. Provocative testing. Come sure. on, come on, pain. Mm-hmm. Come on. I can yeah. handle you. I'm not scared of you. Let's yeah. have coffee. I know you feel 10, like a 10, 10, yeah. 10. But guess what? I can dial you down to right. five. Mm-hmm. It's, I can do that. I have that ability. Right. And people can learn that. And that's what's the, mm-hmm. the name of the program. Yeah. We can learn pain and we can unlearn pain yeah one of the techniques in hypnosis and it's not that similar to what you were just saying uh which is like the uh the control room right so helping people oh she pressed a button but she'll be back because we practiced this before that's okay here i am there's the button there's the button. That's so weird. I didn't press anything, but it went made me go away. Energy. Okay. I think it was Scotty. There? Scotty, what are you doing? Be, beam her I don't back. I see you now. I see me. <laughs> Hopefully I'm still alive. It yeah, says live. Not. So I'm just going to finish telling this yeah, no, story. No, I love it. You're live. Which is uh, having a sense of a control room. And one of the fun things to do with the control room is instead of trying to turn your pain down, is actually try to turn the sensations up first. Because it is that sense of proof. Thank you, Scotty. It is that sense of proof, right? So if you can turn something from a three to a six, then you're like, hey, but I'm really just sitting here in front of a computer. Like, oh, there is a part of my brain that is in charge of this. So now 
I built in the belief that actually now I can turn it down wow. and just beginning wow. that practice and using that visualization, building up that image of the control room, creating a space that feels really real. And then, you know, uh, there's a process called anchoring. So we can anchor in that suggestion um, so that people can connect with it on a daily basis. Um, yeah. Yesterday, I'm doing an integrative uh, medical hypnosis certification. So it's kind of more an advanced um, training. And we even just talked about the comfort scale. So that's flipping this idea from teaching the brain to look for pain to teaching the brain to look for comfort. Right. And so the comfort scale is the same as the pain scale, and you can track how much comfort you have. Yeah. Uh, and so the idea is that we're, you know, the brain is a predictive organ, and it um, perceives what we tell it is important for us to notice. And it's always filtering out information. So it's per always perceiving so much more than what we're aware of, which is neuroception and interoception and proprioception. But um, we inadvertently teach the pain, teach the brain to like inform us of what's important. And so when we make pain, the thing that we're paying the most attention to, then we're teaching the brain to always be noticing pain or discomfort. So we can do the opposite. It's so like whatever the brain does with pain, it can yeah. also do the opposite, right? Yeah. So it's the so, also the capacity so for unlearning. What is that and word? I like to have uh, a more gentle approach. Um, I mean, I can be very direct. And I also like the kind of invitation. Um, so I feel like my podcast, I feel like hypnosis creates invitations. And I really work with people on this idea of gentle neuroplasticity. That is the quality of learning and unlearning is just as important as the learning and unlearning. Because with gentle neuroplasticity, we're embedding this practice of attending and attuning to self with love, yeah. um, always working on this idea of having self-compassion. And there's a lot of research about self-compassion and how self-compassion changes our neurology <laughs> and our physiology. Bless you. Thank you. So it's, I find it's, um, cause there are a lot of people, you know, we, I remember being in a rush to heal, I remember being on a on a on Alan Gordon's Facebook page and I was telling him about an experience that I had and I had this nerve pain, which I usually had never had. And he just told me, you sound very high stakes. And I was like, he just read like, <laughs> like as a gay person, I would be like, he read me to filth. Like that <laughs> felt like somebody seeing me really clearly. And I was like, yes, okay, message received. I need to, as Nicole Sachs would say, hold this loosely, to not be in a rush, to not put all that pressure on myself, right? But there's like energy. So it's like to tap into that energy and that vitality, but not make myself be in a rush to heal or be like, you know, so I think that's what curiosity really mm -hmm. helps as well. And just that attending, that way that we attend to self is part of the rewiring process. Well, it's trust, trusting, trust, yeah. trust, trust that process. Trust, trust that totally. process is what yeah. you know Alan talks about, and that mm -hmm. that patience with yourself. Yeah, because there's the ego, like that enormous patience of this journey, and that the pain and the fear. Yeah, going down the fear. I can I can live with fear. I can live with fear. Mm -hmm. I can even hang out with fear. In fact, if I hang out with my fear, I'm probably my pain would go away. <laughs> So yeah, and so yeah. visualizing, just a, visualizing pain being in the room with you. Like I've had mm -hmm. that with clients where we've like made a room, made their house and all the emotions are in there and letting fear come in and yeah. giving it a cup of tea and a nice yeah. place to sit. And, you know, so there's so many different ways that these tools and practices can help people so I have been so excited. It's been yeah, really I great. I decided. I decided that I was gonna. Um, I know Matthew Rosett is doing hypnotherapy. Mm, great. Um, I'm gonna have you two on because I okay. want to the whole show. I want to be quiet and just hear more about hypnotherapy. I think it will help people become their own hypnotherapist, which is our goal. Sure. Yeah. That they can be that voice 
Mm -hmm. And I think that the three of us could have a really great uh, broadcast. He, he's amazing. He, yeah. he's really, really, and he's and he, he promotes this. I think he's working less, doing different things, but he talks about hypnotherapy. And great. Um, it was the one thing I had one. I had my first show after Michael Galinsky came on. Uh huh. And I five almost five years ago. The second show was with this woman, Lori. Uh huh. Laura. And she had a terrible pelvic condition, like beyond words, like really. Mm -hmm. And twenty, she had tw she saw twenty five doctors. She had a couple surgeries, yeah. and her daughter suggested to her to go to this hypnotherapist. And she was like, what "Right, the heck? yeah." She lies down, and the woman starts to work on her, and her pain level goes down. And she was like, "What? Yeah, her mind." has something to do with this. Yep. And she stopped, teach, she stopped teaching math and became a therapist. Nice. And, you know, it's like, and that was a really interesting, you know, mm -hmm. you know, interesting. And I just want, I want everyone to have that experience because it was mm -hmm. like, she was ready, you know, when the teacher is ready, the students are, the student yeah. is ready, the teacher will come. I want people to really believe mm -hmm. you're not broken. Yeah. You're not damaged. Well, you know, we, I think we're always in a state of, of trance and hypnosis is really normal and natural for us all the time. So when we're watching TV and we're really engrossed in something, that's a form of hypnosis. That's a kind of trance. So, you know, just even using this idea of like, well, what is, what, it, you know, what am I hypnotized to believe about my body? Yeah. That's a good frame and like helps us like create a little bit of distance so that yeah. we can start to unpack all of it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i'm gonna stop talking because i could really talk no about beautiful it. no i know i need no i know it's, it's I'm yeah gonna say goodbye and i'm so happy that really? we came, came to visit and i love when yes thank body you. shows his yeah, beautiful soul you. here and a few more people were in the studio and um Great. it'll be up on our youtube channel okay. Terrific. tomorrow and I'll, I'll share it a little bit on the facebook right. for people to hear i yeah. think i'm going to change the title to you know, there were some really beautiful, beautiful insights and strategies mm -hmm. for hypnotherapy and yeah. maybe somehow coming closer to your healing. I, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll figure out maybe what to call, but yeah, I want to I'm really sure you'll have exactly um, the right. Name. You know, it was beautiful, beautiful. And I, I will have another show with hypnotherapy. It's a very important topic. And, you know, we get into our head and we're in, we're in our intellect mm -hmm. and we do need to come into the body. Yeah. And the heart and the soul and the goof, which is the name of the body. But like, mm -hmm. we do need to have more ways to connect. Mm -hmm. We're not all, a lot of us are not going to get there through our thought pattern. And, yeah. you know, um, so I'm very excited awesome. to see your beautiful face again. Thank Maybe, you. Um, it's in, been uh, such an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for, for, uh, dancing with me because we did things kind of quickly yeah. but it worked out because you're a team player oh thank you, really you. Are. you really well, are. we're all on the same team know, this is a great team to be on really it is, like, it is. <laughs> i mean people heal from all kinds of things and so i never want to be a limiting belief for anybody about what is possible for them in terms of their wellness and i love that we're all Beautiful. sharing the same message just in slightly different ways yeah yeah beautiful so have a wonderful okay. afternoon thank you again good evening good afternoon yeah. good morning to the Goodbye, listeners everybody. and we'll be back next week take good care all right Bye, Deb. Bye. okay one second it's gonna chime off